and buys that field. Now, that seems kind of strange to us. Maybe, how do you find treasure hidden in the field? I mean, we all, that's the stuff of movies and cartoons, right? Of finding treasure. But this is a real, um, uh, applies very well to what people did in Jesus' day. A wealthy person would take his wealth and, and divide it into three parts. One third of his wealth he would use to do more business and transactions and, and live on. Another third he would convert into jewels and precious metals. And that was because if uh, there was trouble in the land and he had to flee quickly, he could take a third of his wealth with him, which would convert in other countries, right? Uh, and so he wouldn't be destitute. And the other third he would bury in a field. And more than likely, nobody would know where he buried it. Not even his family would know where he buried it. And so if the individual would die suddenly, that treasure would be hidden somewhere, and nobody would know exactly where it is. So for him to find it in the field would not be uncommon. So it's, it, it, or, or, or it wouldn't outside the realm of possibility. And so this man finds the treasure. More important than how he found that treasure, because Jesus doesn't even deal with that in the parable, is what he does with the treasure once he finds it, right? So what does he do? He does something kind of funny right away, right? He takes it and he hides it again. My gut tells me he didn't hide it in the same place, because he found it, someone else is going to find it there. So he hides it again. But that's not what, what, where he stops. After he hides it, what does he do? He goes home. And he sells everything he has. Everything. I don't think that would be something that would happen in a day or two. It probably took some time. And then what does he do with the money? He goes and buys not the treasure, but he buys the field in which the treasure is contained. In the parables of Jesus, we take the story and then we ask the question, what is Jesus saying about the reign of God? When we think of the kingdom of God, a lot of times we think with walls and an area. You've got to think in terms of the reign of God, because the reign of God extends everywhere, right? There's nowhere in the universe that is outside of the reign of God. So what is this parable telling us about the reign of God? Well, let's, let's back up a second. You see, there's two, usual, there, uh, two interpretations of these first two parables. The most common interpretation is that the man in the parable is you and me, and the treasure is the gospel in finding it. But there's another, tr another interpretation which makes more sense to me, and that is that the man is Jesus, and we are his treasure. So why do I say that? Go back to what the man did. First of all, he found the treasure. And what has Jesus done to you and me? What has he done for us? He found us. When we were lost, he found us, right? And then what does Jesus do? He gives up everything, everything for you and me. There's nothing he didn't give up for you and me. Heaven he gave up. His friendships he gave up. He gave up his possessions. He has nothing when he hangs on the cross for you and me. He sold out everything for you and for me that he might buy us. That's the word we call redemption. He buys us back from Satan, from the world. Doesn't it perfectly explain the love that God has for us as his people? This is what he has done for us, for Holy Cross Lutheran Church. This group, all of you here today, he found us and has brought us into this community because he loves us. And so then we move on to the second parable. And it seems like it's saying the same thing. And it is to a degree, but there's some major differences in the parable of the pearl of great value. Look at the next two verses, 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. So what are these key differences in this parable? Well, in the parable of the hidden treasure, he stumbles across, he finds the treasure. The merchant, on the other hand, is actively seeking after the treasure. 
And the treasure itself is many, and that's why I kept referring it to us here at Holy Cross, is that we are the ones He has found. The pearl is just one that He seeks after among many pearls, right? And in the parable of the treasure, there's much more purchased than just the treasure. There's the land that's purchased along with it. But not so in this parable. There's only one thing purchased, and that's the pearl. So once again, we've got to ask the question, what is Jesus saying about his reign in our lives that will transform us? He's saying that he searched us for us, that he has paid uh, the, the price again for us. He chose us. Uh, well, let's say it differently. He chose you. It's one pearl. So let's think here. We think first, the first parable we think in terms of all of us together. In this one, we think of us. He purchased you. He searched for you. He found you. He bought you. All of you. And, and I know maybe it doesn't feel that way in your life right now. For some of you, some of you are going through such difficult times. It's really difficult for you to think that, 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 that God cares for you, that He searched for you, that He paid the price for you. But regardless of what you're going through in your life, regardless of how difficult it is and what you're wrestling with, it's still true. Jesus has searched for you. He found you. He paid the price for you because you are of great value. You, every one of you here today, you are so valuable to God. That Jesus died for you. And then brings us into this community, the hidden treasure. So we get to the third parable, the parable of the net. And we know from the way when you read it that it's meant to go with the other two. I mean, it's introduced uh, the same way the previous parable was. Again, uh, the, the kingdom of God can be compared to a net and goes on after that. Those three parables are meant to be together, but it's not saying the same thing. So let's look at it. So let's finish the text, 47 through 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into, the, into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that, in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Paul told Timothy in Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, that God desires all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God's love is cast over all people like the net in the story. You know, the net, it's a pretty simple story. It's cast over out and it gathers fish of all kind into its net. God's love is cast over all people. The problem is within that net, there are fish that are, are listed as good and, and bad. And we know that the good are put into containers and, and then the bad are, are thrown away. And then Jesus says those difficult words to us that, that's what's going to happen at the end of time. And, and that this net of God is going to capture all of us and there's going to be a sorting process. We get that also in Matthew 25 in the parable there of the sheep and goats. The first question we have to deal with in this parable is what makes a fish good and what makes a fish bad. So to answer that question, the first thing we've got to say is what it's not. Two things that it's not. What does not make us a good fish or a bad fish is how good or bad we are. Okay? It's not about what we bring to the table. It's, I've said that many times here. here. It also is not um, God choosing some and not choosing others. And, and so somehow, for some reason, which we don't even understand, uh, God only chooses some people and then he doesn't choose others. It's not what it's about either. There's only one thing it's about that makes us a good fish or a bad fish, and that's faith. Faith in Jesus Christ, the one who was sought for us, the one who found us, the one who's purchased us. Faith in Jesus Christ is the only thing that declares us to be good fish, which then says that the only thing that declares those to be bad fish are those who have rejected Christ. 
I want to get back now to what I said. Paul said to Titus that God desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. We cannot read this parable as though somehow God wants. God's desire is to send people to hell. It's not it at all. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might have life in Him. That's God's heart. That's God's love. And see, you... We are transformed by this love of God to see the world differently. So let's, let's, let's ask the question then, what does all this mean for us? Uh, what, where do we go with here? How do we understand this? There's three points I want you to write these down or take them with you today and to consider them out of these three parables. First of all, we're to relish the fact that we are precious in God's sight. You are precious. We as a community here at the corner of Constitution and Murray, God delights in this group of people as crazy and as broken and as, 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 uh, as, as sinful as we can be at times. He still finds us precious in His sight. We are, 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 are not because of our works or anything like that, just because He loves us. This community is God's delight. Secondly, He wants us to understand that we're chosen you're chosen by Him. Out of His grace and mercy, that one pearl, you're chosen by Him. And seeing that in our community, seeing that who we are, get to the last point. The same love He has for us, He has for others. It doesn't stop just like we're the special people among all. But we're to be transformed by this love of God that when we go out into the world and the culture around us is transformed, because we love them as Christ loves us. That's where the rubber meets the road, right? And that's hard. But may God work this change in us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please stand. Let's declare.